Welcome to the fourth day of the European Observatory's Summer School uh, on Digital Health. I hope that you've uh, enjoyed all the sessions so far, uh, and I can assure you that we have another really interesting session for this afternoon. I will be introducing our speakers uh, as we go through the afternoon, but um, I can already tell you that we have uh, very uh, interesting presentations from a very eminent group of speakers this afternoon, and it's going to be a, a really interesting session uh, for us all to take part in. Um, so uh, if you want to either tweet about the summer school or to follow tweets about the summer school, our hashtag is obssummerschool2021. Um, we also invite you to be taking an active part in the summer school. Do please feel free to use the chat box to uh, ask questions, make comments. If you would like to make uh, questions or clarification to our speakers or to ask more general questions or raise more general issues, and we will draw on those uh, as we come to the panel discussion towards the end of the session. So our format for today, I think you're probably used to it by now, but just in case we have any people who haven't been able to join us earlier on uh, during the summer school, um, we will have our keynote presentation by Dr. Miklos Shoshka, who I will introduce in a few minutes. Um, we will have then uh, some very interesting detailed presentations, and we think that that overall presentation part of the uh, this afternoon session will take us probably about an hour and 10, an hour and a quarter. We'll have a very brief break, which is partly to allow everyone to relax and uh, get a coffee, have a comfort break, but also to encourage you to reflect on what you've heard and give us your questions in the chat. And then we'll have a panel discussion which will draw on your reflections and the issues which we've all heard raised. And then uh, there's even some even more interesting sessions coming tomorrow, but I'll tell you about those at the end of the session. My colleagues, uh, Florian Tiller and Dimitra Pantelli will be monitoring the chat box. And I'm very grateful to them and my, uh, also to Annalisa and Simone for their help in organizing all of this and making sure that it all goes smoothly. So without further ado, uh, I would now like to welcome our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Miklos Soska. Um, from Semmelweis University in Hungary. Um, Miklos, you can be fairly described uh, as a long-standing friend of the observatory and a very well-known figure on uh, the scene within um, European health policy and uh, all the many discussions we've had. And I, I keep telling people about this wonderful island that we should all be on in the Venetian lagoon, and we're not there, but you've, you've been there and you know how nice it is. And I'm very grateful that you've taken time out from your own holiday to come and, and, and talk to us this afternoon. For those very few people who are not familiar with you, um, you have for many years uh, been the director of the Health Services Management Training Centre at Semmelweis University. You have now added to that responsibility by also being Dean of the Faculty of Health and Public Administration at the university. Um, and you have combined your academic uh, um, profile with a role previously as Minister of State for Health in Hungary, and you've also played a very active part in discussions in health policy and health systems far beyond the borders of Hungary with your engagement with the World Health Organization and European health discussions in general. Um, you've been doing some really innovative stuff in Hungary around the use of big data from mobile phones uh, to monitor adherence to social distancing rules. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the Summer School this afternoon. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nick. And, and uh, to the participants and also to the organizers, I really wish that uh, you could go back to the, uh, to the uh, Venice Island because uh, that's the real observatory feeling. If you do not mind, I, I, I start to share my screen uh, immediately and, uh, and jump into the, and jump into the um, presentation. And you, you asked me to, to show the uh, uh, mobile phone or mobile cell uh, monitoring project that we did uh, during the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. And you know, the, the, uh, I have to give you a warning at the beginning. Uh, what we did with the mobile cell 
uh, it, mobile cell information and mobile cell data is, is fully uh, GDPR compatible. This is an aggregated depersonalized data, so we do not know anything about an individual. Uh, but I have to tell you that during the COVID pandemic, uh, we really had some uh, very interesting um, access to data uh, due to emergency uh, regulations. Sorry, I just yeah, uh, I just wanted to show you this chart, which is the uh, which is uh, uh, a network analysis of the Hungarian pandemic network, uh, and and we did uh, did have access to the personal uh, contact files, uh, and uh, and that was a very interesting uh, experience, and then it required very high uh, very high integrity when you when you saw all that data. But you know, we at the at the Faculty of Health and Public Services, we really uh, work around data. Uh, we work uh, as a, as a division of the National Data Asset Agency, and we work closely with the Digital Wellbeing Program Agency of Hungary. Uh, and we did a lot of stuff around data-driven health. Uh, we are involved in artificial intelligence, in predictive, prognostic, uh, and in the and the pathology or radiological diagnostics. And we do a lot of network analytics. Uh, and we do it for social benefit and we want to achieve uh, social impact and we work in a strategic uh, framework of uh, access to data, structured data, creating data lakes, uh, improving data science competences, accessing sector specialists who could work together with data scientists and we work on the commitment of leaders uh, for data utilization so this this gif uh, it is in hungarian but we do not have it in english so yeah the sectoral um, uh, knowledge the data uh, the data science competences so the all these work together and we are the green line we are just improving it every day uh, and this gave us this gave us uh, the the chance to be invited uh, by the COVID-19 operative body of Hungary and we became part of, uh, uh, of the pandemic modeling work group and we were a data-driven solutions uh, action team for the Ministry of Technology and Innovation. We worked with the Prime Minister and also we worked with the Minister of Interior who, who is chairing the operative body. Yeah, you know the COVID was sort of the disruptive momentum that was needed. You know, we, we have a joint national e-health system based on uh, negative consent. So up until you say no, uh, your health data could be shared for health purposes, uh, not for secondary utilization. Uh, but you know, telemedicine took over during COVID, teleconsultation took over, teleprescription took over, and the, and the uh, regulations followed. And you know, the data chauvinism, uh, had to meet the consequences uh, uh, of that behavior uh, and, and saving lives became more important. So we managed to convince a lot of people or, or I have to say, you, I have to, have to tell to you that if anybody was data chauvinistic in that process, I mean, the institution said, I do not share the data with you because I'm the owner of the data. Um, we many times, we just mowed them down. Uh, the, you know, the emergency regulation on data access was really helpful. And, you know, when we did the mobile uh, cell uh, analysis, you know, the corporate social responsibility was at its best, at, it, at its best. Uh, I have to, I, 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 I wish I could share you that feeling, the goosebumps on my skin and brain when we had the first dramatic video conferences with the mobile network providers, uh, and they understood that uh, that sharing the mobile cell data uh, it would be the only possibility at the beginning to monitor contact density and, and monitor the uh, the effectivity of uh, distancing measures. So this and and on their part, this was an investment. It's corporate social responsibility investment. They they shared it, data knowledge and they also shared their expert. So this is basically what we uh, what we did. Uh, so we had the uh, the mobile cell. Uh, movement data between cellular towers uh, and we uh, and you know we at the end i do not have to go into the details but you will have the presentation uh, and then you can uh, follow the uh, methodology but at the end we could calculate the stay home and mobility uh, movement uh, indices uh, and 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 we calculated it on the uh, february reference days one of the advantage of this methodology uh, um, uh, versus the 
uh, versus the smartphone uh, uh, GPS data uh, uh, data follow up is that uh, even the even the old mobile phones uh, in villages with the old people, uh, those could be traced and you could trace the entire movement. And we had, uh, we managed to have all the 9 million Hungarian mobile phones uh, uh, data and we could measure the movement between cellular towers. And I show you the, I show you a very early, early analysis. This is a population level stay home and movement index. The blue is the movement index, the stay home is the green. You see the February uh, movement was the reference period. And, and you know, uh, those dates are signaling, for example, the March 11 date was the start of the distancing measures. And you see the peak in movements before, that's, that's because the people went shopping. And you know, after the distancing measures came in place, the movement dropped down. And, and you could see the, then there was the second round of distancing measures uh, introduced, and there was again a shopping spike. Uh, but, but we could see that, there were, that, that the distancing measures were quite uh, effective. And we could monitor and we gave feedback for the decision makers, fine, people are complying. And you know, it was very important to them because the, the changes in our number uh, could, be, could be sort of compared to the movement density. So they could see that whether the distancing measures are enough. Uh, or there should be another, uh, there should be another round of distancing measures, and you could see the difference between uh, the national data and Budapest data. Uh, the Budapest people experiencing that they are in a big city, they should be more careful. So we could see that the big city uh, was uh, was more, how to say, uh, disciplined in uh, in the in the distancing measures. Yeah, we could manage we could manage the data by county. We could see the we could see the uh, the introduction of school lockdown, the curfew, and the shopping before the curfew, uh, and and the impact of distance education was uh, distance education was uh, introduction of distance education was very visible in Budapest, so that really decreased the movement density. So we had a very interesting insight and a very interesting monitoring device, and and remember. The, the, the charts that I was showing to you, these were the first wave charts. So we have already started to uh, analyze and monitor uh, the movement index and the stay home index uh, in uh, early March, late February. So it was a very early model uh, and a very early model in action assisting the decision makers. Uh, one, of the, one of the very important uh, uh, feedback that we gave to the uh, that we gave to the politicians was on the quarantine tourism. Uh, what we see in the uh, what we saw around the Lake Balaton uh, was that uh, uh, at, at the stage uh, we we show you the data. It was not three or four hundred percent, but in 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 a matter of weeks uh, there were three or four times more movements around the Lake Balaton holiday areas. Those were those were flocked by quarantine tourists. So the, the government authorized the local, uh, local mayors uh, to do uh, local uh, lockdown measures, so distancing measures, because they knew the places where the quarantine tourists were, uh, were flocking those uh, places. So, so it was really a very important feedback and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and the monitoring in action uh, during the uh, times of the first and the second and the third wave. Uh, this is basically the, uh, basically the, now the colors uh, have changed because we regularly uh, updated the, uh, the application. We put it into a Microsoft Power BI uh, visualization platform, which was not necessarily easy. Uh, and I think there are more than 10 billion uh, records that we had to put together and, and structure and use for analytical purposes. And what you see here, the light blue is the stay home index. Uh, the dark blue is the uh, movement index. Uh, the first, uh, first wave or the first cave uh, is, the, is, the, is the first wave. Uh, this is the summer. Everybody was happy that the, that the pandemic is over. And then the red line shows the cumulative case numbers. So the, the, the increase in movements uh, was, uh, 
was leading us to the second wave. Uh, and, uh, and you know, somewhere around here, the British variant came. So there was a new lockdown needed to bring down the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the case number. So we could, we could really, uh, we could really use uh, uh, this method uh, as, a, as a feedback um, and, a, and a decision support tool. Uh, this Power BI is still running on, on, uh, on, the, on the iPad of government members, and it is not necessarily them, but their assistant or, or staff assistants or staff members uh, come back and uh, come back regularly and check the, uh, check the details. Yeah, Apple, who published their data a little later, you see the somewhat similar, uh, similar, uh, you know, they are, they are showing the uh, decrease in, um, in driving uh, public transport uh, and walking. Uh, you see the decrease in, uh, in movement density. So we had the same uh, as Apple, we had the same as Google, and Waze had the, had the similar, uh, similar cave in mobility. So we were very proud that, that when in some at end of April, May, Waze, Google, and, uh, and Apple started to publish their data, we already had our system in operation and we didn't have to beg. And by the way, uh, we wanted to have Google's data, but they did not share with us. So we didn't have to beg to a, a, a giant, but we had to talk to uh, the national, uh, um, national mobile service providers, which was Vodafone, uh, Telenor, and, uh, and Telecom, Deutsche Telecom, a daughter company, the Hungarian Telecom. So, so we basically uh, negotiated with local companies and then they acted very responsibly. Yeah, and that's when we eased up uh, and everybody, but boom, started to move, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so we could even monitor the the, uh, the uh, recreation of movement density uh, of um, uh, after the after the lockdown uh, ended, lockdown or the curfew ended. We also saw that. Yeah, we are very proud of the article that we wrote about it, uh, and and it's still leading in the. Uh, this ranked first in the scientific reports uh, article. So really very proud, and I think this is because. Oh, sorry, this is to remember me uh, to that, that we, I have two minutes. Uh, so I will, I will have to show you some other slides as well, but you can, you can read the details of the article on the, on, the, uh, on the Nature Scientific Reports platform. So the data team had different uh, other products. We, we had a COVID BI, yeah, the mobile cell monitoring was a, uh, was a BI application itself. We did vaccine monitoring and then we were tracing the vaccine utilization. So we really uh, did helpful uh, applications for the decision support. We still do the anti-vaxxer sentiment monitoring and then that's an, that there's some AI uh, application in it. And we also take part and our team members take part in the AI development of, uh, of COVID pathology. Uh, uh, pathology tissue analytics. So we, we do a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of data-driven stuff around, around uh, COVID. What I show you here is not, not our product, but uh, this was developed by some, uh, by some uh, astronomists. And uh, what you see here is the mobile phone movement around one Hungarian uh, high school, St. Angela. This is in Budapest. The blue dots are uh, business subscribers, uh, the red dots are female sub subscribers, and the green dots are uh, male subscribers of mobile services. And what you see here is uh, how they move around uh, the uh, move around that uh, that gymnasium, that high school, Saint Angela. Just imagine the power of uh, of mobile data to identify super spreading, uh, to identify the nature of connectivity and the connectivity and, co and the contact density uh, in Hungary. So our understanding that fine, okay, we did a monitoring uh, solution and that was, that was good for uh, decision support and understanding uh, the, uh, the mobile density during uh, pandemics. But I think uh, using this mobile uh, analytics approach uh, I think we could develop new pandemic modeling uh, solutions uh, for the future. And if you do not mind, as, uh, as uh, I'm just uh, stop sharing the presentation. If you do not mind, I'm just 
sharing uh, the sharing the screen of the uh, so, uh, of the BI platform. So this is the actual BI platform. It exists and it shows the. For example, I can I can uh, click on the capital city. I can click on the larger cities. You see the cities over twenty five thousand inhabitants. Those are the most undis undisciplined. Budapest, yes, they stayed home and moved less. Yeah, the, the larger cities, no, they did not stop. The villages, even the villages where the pandemic was not that visible, even the villages were uh, more, uh, how to say, uh, disciplined than, uh, than, than the bigger cities. And yes, we also had some other, uh, some other uh, uh, BI, business intelligence solutions. This is the overall uh, COVID, um, uh, COVID analytics platform that uh, that uh, that is uh, still operating on the decision uh, makers uh, decision makers uh, um, uh, iPad. So what we what we did is that we not only developed a solution, but we tried to institutionalize and put it into uh, put it into the hands of the decision makers. Uh, so we we wanted to put data in action but we wanted to do it in an institutionalized way. Fine, okay, we could send them the charts every day, but we wanted, uh, wanted them to feel that this kind of decision support data can be in your pockets uh, and you can refer it anytime that you want. So as I said at the beginning, uh, we, we work on the commitment of leadership. So, uh, so when we developed this very interesting methodology, uh, we not only wanted to have the methodology, but wanted to convince uh, the decision makers uh, that, it, that it would be it would be nice to invest in further developments. And I think I'm I'm about to to finish the presentation. I hope I was not longer. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Nikos. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I know I'm not the only person who thinks that because I can see a whole series of questions in the chat. <laughs> We're gonna... yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just I just, I just switched off the sharing and I see boom. It's very, yeah, it's but but I, and we'll come to that. We'll come to that. We'll have, this is going to be a very interesting panel discussion. But it's so powerful what you've done there, and I'm just it's the 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 power as you rightly say of those tools is really really remarkable. And you said right at the start um, that you've done this in full compliance with GDPR and with the uh, with the data protection regulations. And so I think I'm sure we'll want to come back and talk about that. But Florian, um, uh, what kind of questions, do, what kind of questions for clarification do we have that um, that we might want to immediately follow up with Miklos? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Nick. And thanks, Miklos, for this wonderful presentation. Really interesting, as you just said. Um, the chat really has been reflecting this as well. So a um, couple of questions in there um, asking about the, the, the sharing of the available data. So Maya, for example, has been asking um, whether the data that you collected, Miklos, um, is somehow publicly available and whether volunteers, researchers especially, who would like to work with this data and analyze it would actually have access to it. Um, Maya, we also see the one regarding Google. We'll get back to this later, I suggest. Um, but maybe I collect another one or two for Miklos right here. Oh, yeah. So Miklos um, Sutayud has been asking also um, just a question for clarification whether the same mobile phone data that is used here is also used for contact tracing in, in Hungary or, um, and whether it's effective or whether this is a different mechanism. Um, and then also coming from, from the same participant from Sutayud, um, whether the mobile phone is used to track people's movement in relation to COVID infections or whether this is a, also a different, different mechanism that's being used. So if you could address those, this would be really great. Yeah, uh, so about the contact tracing. So the data that we have is not uh, good for contact tracing. The one that the astronomists have, uh, that, that kind of data export could be used uh, for contact tracing. That's depersonalized data as well, uh, but that, that is much closer to individual contact tracing. From the beginning, we did not want to use it for contact tracing and that would not have been GDPR compatible. Uh, the Chinese used it. Um, what, and, and there was an effort in Hungary for contact tracing, but that was use, using the Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth uh, contacts between mobile phones and, the, and there was a, 
there was a Siemens developed uh, this is planned as a pan-European uh, contact tracing application by the by Germany, but that was not introduced uh, by Hungary. So contact tracing was not institutionalized in Hungary at the end. There were efforts, but they were not uh, institutionalized. The the access uh, to the data. Uh, you have, if you team up with us, uh, you will be able to access the data. So, so please send us the reference. Uh, you know that, and that is that is because of the of the special COVID. Uh, uh, it was uh, due to the so we 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 are not able to share it uh, as because we are we fall under the uh, under the COVID operative body uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so we are able to integrate uh, researchers uh, with our team and then they can work with the data, but we are not able to share it uh, with you. That would be legally too long. Uh, and, and, and if you have a good idea, just join us and, uh, and, and do it with us. The, the Google one, uh, there was, uh, uh, how come somebody asked, how come that Google do not share the local country level data? So I want to come back to that whole question about because I really want to so that I'm going to give you advance warning, Miklos, because I think this is a whole sort of tension between potential of the data and privacy. But for me, there's also the question about strategic independence, because there's been this tension about, you know, who is actually allowing stuff here? Is it the big tech companies or is it public authorities? And you seem to have found a way through that in Hungary. Okay which is super interesting. And I'd love to come back to that in the panel, if that's okay. Yeah, okay. Good, perfect, good. But it's just, yeah, we, we said today, because the title of the session is Digital, uh, um, digital Health Fueling you know, New, new um, Research and New Ways of Doing Research. And I think I, don't, I cannot be the only researcher who is looking at the data that you've just described and is just thinking, oh my gosh, there is so much that we could do with this. So, thank you so much for the presentation and we'll come back to discuss many of the issues I think that this raises when we come into the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so this is one example of uh, really new research. Um, and what I'd like to do now, is, it gives me particular pleasure to introduce a fellow Oxford uh, colleague, although a much more eminent one, um, in the form of Dr. Marion Maffam, who is a clinical research fellow at the Nuffield Department of Population Health here at the University of Oxford. Um, I think, Marion, I think many people will have heard about the recovery trial, which has been one of the world's leading resources uh, in it, aiming to identify potential treatments for COVID-19. Um, but I know that you are in particular the data linkage lead for this trial and I think we all look at it and just think well how did they manage to do that actually um, and I'm hoping we're going to learn a bit more about that from your presentation so it's a pleasure to welcome you over to you. So thank you for the introduction and it's a real pleasure to be here to talk about the recovery trial on, on behalf of the chief investigators and all the other investigators um, and before I get on to the use of data and the details in the trial itself I want to actually go back to quite an old fashioned research idea, but it's so fundamental to what we're trying to do here. So I just want to be clear that the reliable assessments of the effects of the treatment needs randomization to avoid systematic error. If you simply observe um, people who happen to receive the treatment and compare them to people who don't, you cannot tell whether it's the effect of the treatment or other differences between those two groups. And if you want to find out the effects of treatment, on important outcomes like death, you have to study large numbers of people to avoid getting the wrong answer by chance. So we know this, but we don't seem to always apply it. So COVID-19 represented an urgent need to randomize. We had a major public health crisis, um, lots of patients being hospitalized with COVID, high mortality, no proven treatments at the beginning of the pandemic for this new disease, lots of theories, widespread use of unproven uh, treatments. Um, and this really was an, it was an urgent need for large-scale randomization to identify effective treatments. And recovery was set up to identify effective treatments in patients hospitalized with um, COVID-19. So what have we achieved in the nearly 18 months since the study started? Well, incredibly, this child has produced robust results about nine potential treatments three of which worked. So in June last year, we showed that the steroid dexamethasone reduced the risk of death in patients hospitalized with COVID-19. The treatment was more effective in those with greater lung involvement. In those who were already on a ventilator, death was reduced by a third. 
So for every eight patients in ICU treated with steroids, one would live as a result. In January, we found that the, um, even on a background of high steroid use, the IL-6 blocker, the rheumatoid arthritis drug, tocilizumab that targets the immune system, further reduced death by 15%. And those patients who were studied in that group all had low oxygen levels and markers of high inflammation in the blood. And then more recently, we showed that the, a combination of two monoclonal antibodies targeting the spike protein of the virus reduced the risk of death by a fifth in patients who hadn't produced antibodies to the virus themselves. We also found that these six treatments were not effective in patients hospitalized with this disease. And this is really important because it avoids unnecessary patient exposure. All these treatments have some side effects and it allows healthcare systems to focus on what does work. Randomization is ongoing. There's expansion internationally. There's a phase one assessment of, uh, of dimethyl fumarate. There are assessments in children and there are other assessments in adults going on. But what I want to talk about now is exactly what you asked. How have these results been achieved so quickly? So I think the absolute key factor here before we get on to the use of data is that the fact that the trial was really simple, was really easy for doctors who were busy in hospitals treating patients with COVID to put their patients in. Simple eligibility, you just had to be hospitalised with proven or suspected COVID. Simple outcome or cause mortality. Simple randomization, assigning patients between the treatments or um, control. And treatments were just prescribed by the doctor. There was no attempt to, to, um, to, to keep a placebo. Simple data collection, a one page form, a randomization of 28 days later, supplemented by linkage to NHS data sets, as I'll talk about in a moment. Another key factor though, was the fact that the trial got up and running very, very quickly. So the protocol was written between within seven days of the first case in the UK and was approved by the Research Ethics Committee and the regulator, the MHRA, within a week. That shows uh, two things, that um, the fantastic engagement from the MHRA in terms of turnaround time. At one point, they approved an amendment to the protocol within 24 hours. And also the huge advantage of having one National Research Ethics Committee. Um, uh, for, uh, as we do in the UK. And therefore the trial was able to randomize large numbers of patients in the first way. The second point is it was adopted across the UK. So 177 hospitals took part, that's almost all acute hospitals in the UK. 10% of patients admitted to hospital during the pandemic with COVID were, were involved in this trial. Partly because of the simple procedures that I've talked about, making it easy for site staff to put their patients in, and partly because of incredible support across the National Health Service that we have in the UK. So there was support directly from the NHS. Um, treatments available in pharmacies were made available to the trial so that they didn't all have to be supplied by the coordinating centre. Support from the National Institute for Health Research in terms of staff available at the sites to identify suitable patients and go through the consent procedure. There were letters to all hospitals from the chief medical officers encouraging doctors to put their patients into this trial and a number of other national um, platform trials. And the treatments to be tested were assessed independently by the UK COVID-19 Therapeutics Advisory Panel. Um, so they could look at all of the evidence supporting uh, different potential treatments, weigh that up carefully and make a recommendation to the recovery investigators to put a particular treatment into the trial. So what about the data? Well, we've operated quite a novel hybrid data collection system for this trial. Um, and I don't think we've, or, or, or anyone else has done anything on quite this scale in the UK before. So on the right hand side, we have the more traditional research data where the research staff in the site are entering in data into a specific research form, a case report form. As I said, this is short, done at randomization and at 28 days later, and is entered directly into the trial database. But with consent, we also collect a key identifiers on, on, on the participants, a so date of birth, NHS number or CHI number in Scotland. And these could be sent to national data custodians, such as NHS Digital, um, who can link the data they hold, um, collected as part of the routine provision of care, and supply those data back to the researchers. 
So we've managed to link our participants to uh, six um, data custodians um, across the UK. And from these organisations, we can get coded data about all hospitalisations um, with um, diagnosis and procedure codes. We get uh, core specific mortality um, as recorded on the data set uh, on the death certificate and also um, fact of death uh, as rapidly as the NHS knows it. We get um, data sets about treatments um, given in critical care, about diagnosis and treatments in primary care. We receive COVID um, data sets such as the SARS-CoV testing data and some specific, specific um, disease specific uh, registries uh, which would be particularly useful for long-term follow-up. So the important point here is that these data sets are already collated nationally and there is already an application process by which they can be um, disseminated. So what we were able to do is tap into that infrastructure and bring in the data sets for our particular participants. And of course, these are identifiable um, because they're linked to our participants. So what does, that, what does that allow us to do? Well, we can get complete unbiased follow-up. Patients are frequently moving from one hospital to another. And so the research staff may not know what happened to that individual, but we can track them wherever they're treated across the UK. There's less burden on the local staff. They don't have to fill in long forms. For example, we were able to identify the individual's ethnic group from their routinely collected healthcare data. And it avoids the need for source data verification, which would usually be required in a trial, that the sponsor or the coordinating team would go back and check some or all of the data entered by the local research staff against the medical notes to make sure it's right. But we were able to avoid that really lengthy process by looking for discrepancies across different data sets. And it allows us to do more research. We can find out what the long-term effects of these treatments are, um, particularly what the impacts of the treatment is on um, long COVID, on the development of chronic lung or kidney disease, for example. So what have we learned as researchers in doing this? Um, well, for us, it was a real challenge. We have 20, 25 years um, of experience of working with these, some of these data sets. But just doing things on this scale is quite a challenge. And we had to do things very quickly. We had to turn around at time um, in, in days or sometimes hours in terms of getting the data sets and processing them. We clearly have to be robust in terms of validating all the processing steps, um, version control and the algorithms and archiving to regulatory standards. And obviously um, security is, is absolutely key um, and keeping the, 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 the data secure. Um, it's also important that this is done with public trust and we try to be completely transparent with our participants. We put all the information on our website and we also wrote to all surviving participants or most surviving participants to thank them for their contribution to the trial and tell them what we were doing with their data. But I think the key, key fact here is that the regulatory framework for clinical trials was not written with this sort of data collection model in mind. It's actually um, quite difficult to fit this into um, compliance with some of the current uh, regulations, which have a very strict concept that the local site and the local investigator is responsible for all data collection. Um, and I think that that's something, the acceptability to regulatory, regulatory bodies is something that we really need to tackle. So in summary, uh, I, I'm utterly convinced that randomised trials are an essential component of high quality care and arbitrary use of unproven treatments can't be, can't be justified. Um, simple large trials like um, recovery uh, produce, study outcomes that matter and change practice. And I think these are the key factors that have made recovery a success. The simple design, support across the NHS and our novel use of data. And I would advocate um, prioritising and enabling simple large trials in terms of the regulatory framework. Thank you for your attention. All right, again, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see the, the, the detail of what, you, of what it took actually to generate these, um, these, these, these kinds of findings. Um, Florian, unless you... Uh, um, Ah, I, I, I was just about to say we don't have any questions in the chat, but actually, I think we we we, uh, we might do Florian. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to come to you because I think 
people, I think people were just absorbing what you were saying man, and, and, and thinking about the consequent challenges. So I have some, I have some more general questions about, because you, you've raised a couple of really interesting points about the importance of linkage, for example, and the interface with the regulatory expectations. And I want to come back to those when we come back to the panel discussion. But Florian, I think there were some more specific questions in the chat. Over to you. Thank you, Nick. There were indeed some. Uh, and thanks very much, uh, Marian, for this presentation. So one question that is coming from Anita was on how you, uh, Marion and team managed the, the consent process actually for, for the data collection. And also whether you could please indicate the scientific publication that resulted from this already. And then Vanessa has been asking, um, how did you overcome data confidentiality issues? So, so quite related with the first question as well. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll talk about the consent and confidentiality issues together. So the consent for the trial and for the data collection and the linkage was taken together by the treating physicians or the, um, or, or, or the research nurse in the hospital. Um, so they were provided with an information leaflet uh, um, and provided written informed consent. If they weren't able to consent, um, then uh, the consultation was made with their relatives or an independent representative, if that were maybe not available. And then they were informed um, and given the, the, the chance to consent uh, as soon as they regained capacity to consent. Um, but one of the purposes of writing to surviving patients was you know, a recognition that um, even if you have written informed consent from somebody who's acutely ill with COVID, they may not remember all of the details. So we, we sent that letter after they'd recovered to say, hey, you, you, know, you signed up for us, here's all the information online. If you want to change your mind and don't want us to collect any more data, that, that's fine, just let us know. In terms of confidentiality, all the data transfer processes are, are, are secure and to NHS standards. So we send identifiers over, using secure portal or, or NHS secure methods, and we get identifiable data back. We do have to do that in order to um, link the, the patients to the trial participants. Um, but actually, you know, that's explicit in the consent and therefore that is um, uh, acceptable to do. And these patients have, you know, have, have, have enrolled in a clinical trial. This is very different to studying people without them being aware that you're studying. Thank you. Do you have any, I mean, there's so many questions coming up. There's a great one actually about how the overall cost and speed of this compares with a standard trial, but I'm going to keep that one for the panel. Um, well, I would, do you have any sense in terms of that consent issue still as to what the, what the consent rate was? I, if you were to characterize it, was it virtually everyone was happy who was asked was happy to be part or about 50-50 or very few. What was your sense of the acceptability of the trial to, um, to people who were potentially eligible? We don't actually know that. I mean, we know that nine out of 10 people didn't go into the trial, but we don't know who was approached and said no, and who just came in in the middle of the night and the doctors didn't think to put them in, or perhaps they were so critically ill or so many other um, medical conditions that it really weren't thought suitable for the trial. So, so sadly, we, we don't have information about that. But, but recruiting 10% of all the patients admitted is actually pretty high, pretty high. Um, for a single trial. So, so we assume that it was sort of acceptable to, to lots of people, at least. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Again, many questions we're going to come back to in the panel, but for sake of time, we're going to move on just now. So thank you very much, Marion, and we'll come back to you in the panel discussions. And thank you, Florian. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, is turn to Fred Lefebvre, um, uh, the Ministry of uh, Health, Welfare and Sport in the Netherlands. Um, uh, and uh, Fred is project leader in the Department of Innovation in the Ministry um, of Health, Welfare and Sport um, and has had a wide ranging career uh, both within and beyond the Netherlands and again is one of these people who is I think very fairly well known within the, uh, the European scene. Um, and the innovation that you've been working on within the Netherlands has been to do has been specific to COVID-19, but has also looked beyond that at issues around big data and artificial intelligence in healthcare, for example. So, um, Fred, I'm very much looking forward to um, uh, your presentation and to hearing more about the experience in the Netherlands. 
And as if by magic, there it is, because we have wonderful colleagues here in the observatory. Um, and Fred, over to you. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction, uh, Nick. Uh, and thank you also for the opportunity to discuss this topic uh, over here. Um, I would like to go into the personal health environments, as this is one of my main topics in the innovation de departments and other big uh, initiatives related to, uh, to health data. Sorry for not showing my slides directly because I had some, uh, some issues. Um, so the next one, please. Um, well, first, who am I? Um, I'm working already for 20 years in the uh, Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sport. Uh, first of all, in the international department and later in the long-term care department dealing with palliative care. And since uh, two years, indeed, in the, uh, the innovation uh, department. Uh, in 2011, I had the great opportunity um, to participate in the uh, summer school, uh, really in uh, Venice. Uh, the proof is this diploma that I showed here. I understand that it is a rare, getting increasingly rare because I saw in the chat already some questions about the certificate this year that of course cannot be, uh, be issued in the same form. Um, and you see already the names of uh, Dr. Figueras and uh, Dr. Reinhard Busse um, who were there as well. And it was a really, uh, great opportunity to go in depth uh, for a whole week uh, in a top on a topic, uh, in this case, uh, aging. And later I also participated in health system performance assessment and patient oriented uh, healthcare. Uh, so when I heard that the topic this year was innovation, uh, I contacted the organizers and offered uh, to tell something about the Netherlands. And uh, well, thank you for giving me this, uh, this opportunity. Next slide, please. Uh, before going into the personal health environments um, and the data integration, uh, first, uh, some words on the scene in the Netherlands. Um, well, the OECD already uh, said that um, the Netherlands has not really an integrated health information system. In fact, we asked them to, to investigate. Uh, later this year, they will publish a full report on it, uh, but already uh, uh, Reinhard Busse showed us this week that the data in the Netherlands are not uh, of the highest level. Um, so there is uh, some work uh, to do. Uh, we also uh, actively participate in the European health data space that we also received the presentation on uh, this week because just national approaches do not work. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues is in fact uh, uh, working also in the department in, uh, in Brussels. Then we have uh, an interesting uh, health system in the, in the Netherlands. Um, uh, of course, I gave uh, many presentations working in the International Affairs Department on our system of managed competition with multiple insurers and uh, private uh, not-for-profit uh, hospitals and how we combine that all, all that. Uh, but in this case, our rather fragmented system uh, with many stakeholders appears to be a bit more challenging when it comes to health information uh, systems. Um, the same goes for, uh, for addressing a, a pandemic like COVID, but it is a different uh, story. So it is a bit difficult for us, as, uh, as for me as a Dutch person, but I must be a little bit more modest about our efforts in, in the field of health information. Um, on top of that, we, um, uh, we also had uh, a political choice in 2011 not to try to install a centralized system for patient uh, records. So that was an additional challenge. And of course, more recently, uh, we see that the use of big data is uh, very promising, um, but also uh, prone to abuse. Uh, you look at all the, the, the information on, on Facebook, etc. Uh, so people are a little bit more hesitating whether to make available their health data in whatever form. Um, so that doesn't help uh, public support for these efforts. Next uh, slide, please. So what was our uh, solution, especially to this political reality that we couldn't uh, have a central health record system? Well, we decided to uh, introduce the public health environment, PGO in Dutch. 
um, which is an online application app or web-based, and it is not a portal by the uh, health uh, providers. So you can have multiple portals by hospitals, your primary care doctor, your pharmacy, etc., but only one um, public health environment. Uh, on the other hand, there are multiple providers of these environments uh, so that people can choose from uh, the different alternatives. So we have a place owned and chosen by the patients to collect and share health data collected by different care providers and by yourself. So there are many options on uh, whether uh, to use it. You can opt not to use it at all uh, and how to use it uh, very intensively or just for collecting your data. So in this way, it is our model uh, to citizen control of, uh, of health data. This is the next one. So this is an example of a um, um, uh, of a personal health environment. Um, uh, so this is a, a dummy, uh, not the real one, but there are several real ones already in in uh, working. Uh, and you enter this screen by two-factor authentication or any other uh, safe way of entering this this uh, this screen, because after all, here are your health data. But if you go then to my dossier, you can opt to retrieve your data from different health providers. And every time that you do that, you will have uh, to use um, the, um, uh, the login by, uh, by our national secure system that you also have to use for your taxation and other ways of uh, communication with the, uh, the government. And apart from that, in my dossier, you will find your data then. Apart from that, there are different blocks and modules for um, appointments, uh, self-measurements that you can introduce by the apps that you are using, and any, any other services uh, that a producer of a uh, personal health environment wants to offer. So there will be some diversity in that. Next slide, please. So what are the advantages uh, we think in future of a uh, personal health environment. Uh, well, it's insight in your own health data in one place. Uh, no need to repeat your story uh, from uh, you decide to share it uh, with uh, whom. Um, you can read the conclusions of an appointment at ease at home. Uh, often people forget what is being uh, discussed at the doctor's place. Uh, able to integrate and check your medication uh, prescribed from different healthcare providers. You can receive personalized information on treatments or your disease. So the healthcare provider can send you uh, brochures with also personalized uh, information. Uh, and there is a very important, no need to log in at multiple portals of different uh, healthcare providers uh, to have all your information in one place. So the next one, please. Of course, there are privacy and security issues and especially related to the exchange of data between the patients and the care providers. Uh, we have some rules, protocols and standards. We call that METMAI agreements. Um, it is basically a kind of power plug that everybody has to use. Uh, and for example, if Google and Apple wants to offer a personal health environment in the Netherlands, they also have to follow these rules. Next slide, please. So our vision right, for the uh, related to, to the uh, use of health data and personal public health, uh, personal health environments. Sorry, here is public, it must be personal. The coming years, personal health environments will increasingly become or, uh, a or even the main source of health data. And uh, these are data collected from data sets of various healthcare providers brought together in this PHA, as well as data collected by people themselves on their health and uh, maybe even ways of living. Next slide, please. Um, apart from that, we also have some other big health data collecting initiatives for secondary use, among others uh, for research. Uh, and here the story becomes a little bit more blurry also for us. Um, we have, for example, uh, Health RI research infrastructure, um, which has just started. It, it is financed from our national growth fund. Uh, 
60 million euros they will receive and their task will be to integrate and standardize uh, health data. We have a big program, a national program on artificial intelligence uh, that are also looking at uh, health data and have a special branch for healthcare and uh, AI. We have Cumulus that is uh, a program uh, for data from uh, academic hospitals, um, also a big program. We have our central statistical office, uh, like we learned uh, this week also in Canada. Uh, they are doing a lot of work on broader data integration and making available uh, data sets. And very interesting, we had a proposal for a national platform, which was published in one of our leading newspapers um, by a company. Um, and they propose a kind of company owned by the state and the citizens who can monetize their health data so that maybe even healthcare as a whole would become a little bit cheaper. Uh, but these are only a few. I see Nick appearing. <laughs> uh, last slide, please. Um, so what are our challenges? Um, well, we would like to make sure that uh, all parties benefit. So the researchers, uh, the care providers, industry, especially AI, uh, policy advisors and individuals. Um, we also would like to reconcile these new approaches for big data sharing by the APIs, the open standards, with the old efforts and the existing standards that we are working with already for a few years. We would like to improve the quality of health data because especially our AI project uh, shows us that um, also the, the input for the big data for the AI is not always um, uh, good enough, a lot of bias, uh, unstructured, uh, incomplete data. Um, we would like to create and keep support by politicians and, uh, and the citizens, even if we start working with this uh, um, uh, personal health environments uh, where in the beginning a lot of issues will, will come up uh, for sure. And we would like to combine all the efforts that I just mentioned, uh, and we will start a kind of whole system in the room uh, um, um, discussion uh, later after summer. Uh, so it is work in program, progress, and I would like to compliment the summer school for uh, putting this on the agenda, the data and the research, because many exciting things will uh, happen the coming years. Uh, not just AI, but also the involvement of, of patients in, uh, in collecting uh, data. So um, I'm looking forward to that <laughs> and uh, would like to thank you very much for your attention. And for thank you very much for a really interesting presentation um, and for this insight. And I think we're going to have a really interesting basis for discussion when we come to the panel, because it's such you know, three very different approaches that we've seen being taken here. And I think, it, and, and underlying all of them, I can see from the chat some questions about, you know, the same tension that we always wrestle with, which is about, you know, the usefulness of this data, but also the need for consent and trust and how we, how we sustain all of these things. Um, Florian, uh, may I invite you to appear? See, when I appear, people are like, kind of, oh gosh, I need to stop talking. But when you appear, it's the start of an interesting discussion. You see, I, I, I think you've got the right role here. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, questions from the chat. What are some of the points that people have raised for clarification from Fred? Yeah, thanks very much, Nick. And, and thanks, uh, of course, very much to you, Fred, as well. So two questions for clarification that have come in from Maya are straightforward, actually. One would be, um, would you call the PhD app a sort of a centralized data holder in that sense? Um, what are your thoughts on this, Fred? And then the second one would be, how many care providers are actually currently using it? Um, Kathleen, yeah. we are also seeing your questions, of course, on the um, public awareness and communication of, of, this, uh, of this whole environment, but let's move this one to the panel for later, please. So over to you, Fred. Okay, well, indeed, it is a kind of, uh, at least for the, uh, for the citizen, it is a kind of centralized data holder and also something that you're going to use for the rest of your life uh, if you want to opt for another health environment and you will ensure that the data can be transferred or you can get them again from your uh, healthcare providers. And how many care providers use it? Uh, well, uh, after this summer or even now, um, I just took my data from my primary care doctor and around 4,500 primary care doctors are going to use it. 
next year the uh, the hospitals uh, will will start sharing data um, we also have the mental health institutions and uh, well our purpose is that all um, organizations with health data relevant for the uh, for the citizen that they will participate and they will receive money we have big huge programs even for adjusting their it systems so that they can uh, ensure that these data can be um, um, uh, can be exchanged very interesting thank you I did also note your point there, you, you, you made the point on the way through that even if Apple or Google want to offer certain types of apps within the DOT system, then they have to follow your rules. And again, I'm giving advanced warning, as I, I said to Miklos, I think that you know, this question of strategic independence is one that, I, and, you know, and how we balance this, I think is one I want to come back to in the panel. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for the, um, uh, the, the presentation. Um, so I'd like to turn now uh, uh, to the final presentation um, of, these, uh, of this part of the, um, of the session this afternoon um, and to welcome our colleague, uh, Dr. Konstantin Hippenen from the European Commission. Um, uh, Konstantin is a policy officer working uh, on digital health in DG Santé, the health DG of the European Commission. Um, who are also partners of the observatory. We're very glad, um, to, particularly glad to have you here. Um, and you've been involved in many different digital health projects within the commission. And before you came to the commission, um, Constantin, you were responsible for the technical architecture of the Finnish eHealth hub. So you have both a, a national and a European perspective. Um, uh, I know that uh, today you're going to be talking about something which builds on all of those skills um, at the European level, but we're, we're very glad to have your perspective here for the afternoon. And please, over to you. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving the opportunity to present today um, the an EU-wide uh, infrastructure, EU digital COVID certificate, which is, uh, by the way, not only EU-wide anymore, it covers a few more countries. Um, so let me uh, present it to you shortly. Um, maybe some of you have uh, these certificates already. You can get them on paper or you can get them uh, in the form of uh, mobile apps. Uh, myself, I have both options. I have a mobile app and a paper uh, because um, well, I wanted to test all of them. Uh, but normally <clears throat> you, can, you can choose. Um, some countries, for example, provide such uh, digital versions in the form of PDF files. That is also an option. Uh, and uh, there is always an, uh, an option to get it on paper. So what is included in the certificate? Uh, it's a digital proof uh, because even the paper has a QR code. It's a digital thing uh, that the person has been vaccinated uh, against COVID-19, uh, received a negative test result, or has recovered from uh, COVID-19, meaning that uh, they still probably have um, antibodies and are protected so against future infection. So. Every certificate indeed has a barcode or a QR code, and uh, that barcode uh, has been specified by, by, the, by the experts from the eHealth network. Uh, that's a group of representatives from uh, ministries of health and national eHealth authorities and similar organizations uh, supported by uh, their other experts. So. Um, has been designed to be technically robust, uh, to work uh, on even uh, broken mobile screens in some cases, um, easy to read, um, so uh, it can be printed on paper or in mobile and then scanned using uh, verifier applications. Um, uh, it has information about the holder, very basic information, um, name and date of birth and uh, then the details of this specific statement, uh, be it a vaccination or a test result or recovery. And uh, indeed it's valid everywhere in the EU, but not only EU, um, it's also EEA countries, meaning Iceland, uh, Norway, Liechtenstein, and now also um, it works in Switzerland. So how this is working um, in reality, um, if a person to take vaccination, as an example, uh, if the person is getting vaccinated, so first of all, the person is identified 
and gets the vaccine, uh, data will be registered in the system. Uh, and then at some point when the citizen wants to uh, get a certificate, so unless it's issued automatically, um, then the citizen will request it and the certificate will be uh, issued in a digital or a paper form. Then the citizen will take it um, in their mobile phone or on a paper and uh, bring them to the verification place. Uh, for example, when they're crossing the border, the certificate could be requested. Um, so the verifier at some point could ask uh, the citizen to present the certificate and um, the verifier has a um, so-called verifier app, which will scan the QR code and uh, it, it will verify the digital signature, which is uh, placed uh, over the data, which is included in the QR code. So the QR code has not only the data, but also the digital signature. And after that, um, um, it will show whether it's valid or not. So to make all this to work, uh, we have set up a so-called uh, EU DCC gateway, digital COVID certificate uh, gateway, which does not transport any personal data, uh, no um, health certificates, COVID certificates. They are not uh, going through the gateway, but the gateway is transporting the public keys, which are necessary for verifying um, certificates. So um, if you know cryptography, then uh, you might know that um, in public key cryptography, there is a private key used for signing. And then the public key, which is um, by its name public, uh, it's used for verifying any signatures. So these public keys are transported through the gateway to the places where they are needed, to the verifier apps. And so uh, basically every country is publishing their public keys and every other country is fetching the public keys from this directory and distributes them to the verifier apps. So that uh, when citizens are traveling, um, their certificates could be verified. And now also we are extending this system to third countries. Uh, so um, well, Switzerland is not um, entirely speaking a third country because it's part of the Schengen. Um, but um, we are also working with a number of other third countries to uh, allow them to publish their public keys and um, also to ensure that when their citizens are traveling, um, it would be possible to verify the certificate. I used to show these slides when the map was not uh, green yet, uh, but now it's very green. Um, there are countries uh, which are not part of uh, the EU or EEA or Switzerland. Um, so um, hopefully at some point, many of them will turn green as well. But now it's 31 countries uh, live, uh, 27 EU countries and EEA and Switzerland. And um, the first of them, uh, it was seven countries back then, they started issuing uh, or verifying certificates on 1st of June. And then the regulation, which is uh, defining the system, uh, it uh, entered into force on 1st of um, July. And uh, by that time, all 30 countries were connected. So basically we launched the system one month ahead of the deadline. And then on 9th of July, Switzerland was the first uh, non-EU, non-EEA country to join it. And we are working towards more uh, countries to join the system. And they are in the pipe pipeline uh, undergoing technical testing. You may want to know how many certificates have been issued. And the overall number at this point of time is around 300 million uh, certificates. So it's a huge system. and. Uh, we are not even getting information from uh, 31 countries, but only from 28 at the moment. So, um, and not all our numbers are up to date yet. Everything is based on uh, publicly available specifications. You can go on this uh, website and check uh, everything, how the system is working. It's complete transparency um, and uh, implementations of the reference uh, apps. Uh, they are open source. Many countries which are publishing their verifier apps or wallet apps or some uh, issuance components, they're doing it as well, open source. So we really appreciate this uh, openness and also collaboration of uh, people and experts um, um, developing uh, the system. So the next step 
for us is to extend uh, the system to uh, third countries. And for that, there is support in the regulation, um, a so-called equivalence decision instrument. It basically says that if there is a certificate by a third country, it could be declared as uh, technically equivalent to the EU digital COVID certificate if it's interoperable with the trust framework. And um, with that in mind, we are receiving now um, checklists and applications uh, from third countries. So there is a checklist. So it's called an evaluation checklist for a self-assessment. So the first question which we ask, um, are you already compliant with the system? And if not, we're checking what is missing. And if nothing is missing, then we uh, perform technical check um, um, basically ensuring that everything is, all, is in order, uh, asking for some examples of uh, certificates and checking them. And everything is when everything is found to be okay, um, there is um, a legal procedure, equivalence decision. When it's published, um, then the country is onboarded and uh, ready to uh, issue certificates compliant with the system. So the main takeaways uh, for today uh, is that, uh, well, first of all, it's one of the extremely large infrastructures covering 31 countries at the moment and growing. At the same time, it was built in extend, extremely short uh, time frame. And um, it was uh, built basically March, uh, April, May. Um, so in March and 17th of March, the Commission published the proposal for the regulation and in parallel with the ongoing negotiations about the final texts uh, in the Council and in the European Parliament, we were working uh, day and night on working on uh, implementing the system and publishing all the specifications and software. And uh, we delivered one month ahead of the deadline, uh, starting launching the system first based on uh, national um, law of these countries uh, on 1st of June. So you may ask, uh, is there any connection to research? And that was the question asked by Nick yesterday. Uh, he said, uh, you know, Konstantin, this is about research and you are talking about infrastructures. Could you post some um, research questions to our audience. And um, I didn't need to go far. I just opened the regulation, uh, which says that uh, the commission at some point, um, meaning next uh, spring, uh, it will need to submit um, a report, including four bullet points, an assessment of the impact. How did it affect, uh, impact the facilitation of free movement? So that's the main goal of the regulation, free movement. Then uh, the acceptance of the different types of uh, vaccine. Um, some countries uh, accept um, vaccines used in uh, third countries and some don't accept. So they only accept uh, EMA uh, evaluated vaccines, uh, four of them. What are the impacts on fundamental rights and non-discrimination? And uh, the final bullet point is the protection of uh, personal data during the COVID-19 pandemic. By the way, it was part of the overall design to make the system um, with data protection in mind um, whenever possible and was possible. So uh, the same topics could be indeed considered for uh, research projects and uh, perhaps it would be helpful to understand uh, if researchers would be able to identify specific, um, um, specific uh, findings or specific outcomes on one of uh, these topics. With that, I thank you very much for inviting me once again and uh, for um, your future questions. Thank you very much indeed, Constantine. That was, uh, again, absolutely fascinating. And um, not only did you identify some excellent research topics at the end there, which I thank you very much, and I'm sure many people will be looking at those and, and eagerly um, uh, considering how they might research them. Um, but also, of course, I think one of the themes throughout some of the previous discussions has been that this kind of infrastructure builds on lots of work, research work, infrastructure work, technical development work, which, I mean, I don't know how, what your view would be on that, about how much, you know, the, the capacity of the EU to put in place such an enormous system so fast was itself based on the work which was done in the previous sort of 10, 15 years in terms of research and development around some of those solutions. Do you, what's your, what's your thinking on that? 
yeah, we're standing uh, on the shoulders of the giants in that sense. And we use some uh, very new technology, technologies, by the way. So it's not all these perhaps based on, um, let's say, uh, um, research in all domains, but uh, at least in technical domain, it was very useful uh, that we have uh, all this uh, strong cryptography. We have um, reasonably uh, well, um, you know, um, good mechanisms for packing the information with the QR code, for example, and signing, making everything uh, really uh, secure. Um, so um, it's really, really useful, uh, the work done by researchers in that domain, but also, um, yeah, let's see, um, what will be uh, the outcomes of the research on, let's say, behavioral aspects and uh, all the impacts uh, of the system. So really fascinating to see. And we see a lot of uh, impact already, at least. Uh, maybe because of the summer, we see a lot of uh, travel increase, uh, despite also the increase in, um, in, in, in the um, you know, uh, cases, especially in the Delta variant. So from the health perspective, not always good, but uh, we could see the impact. Uh, least uh, um, of the system on, on travel. Fascinating. Um, Florian, I think let me turn to you and, uh, and uh, ask you what kind of uh, questions for Constantine we have uh, seen in the in the chat. Over to you, Florian. Thank you, Nick, and, and thanks so much, Constantine, as well. Your presentation definitely stood quite a few questions there in the chat. Um, two coming from Maya, who is asking you, Constantine, whether you could say a few words about potential issues of fraud or falsification and how, how the system is uh, maybe preventing it or thinking about um, acting up, up on those. Um, and then the second one uh, from her, uh, you mentioned, Constantine, that not all of the countries who are involved in the scheme are actually reporting about the DCC. Um, without maybe having to name those, could you say a few things about the reasons for some countries not, not, not reporting back? Um, and then Sutayud has been asking something uh, that you did mention on, uh, whether it's only a digital certificate or whether there are paper ones too. So maybe you could just um, confirm that there is the, the paper version, of course. Um, and then Frank was looking um, into and, and more like making a, a statement about how or that it's a pity that people who have been participating in vaccine trials actually did not receive an, an email approved scheme. Um, yeah, you can say, of course, something about it if you like, but maybe doesn't directly touch upon the certificate here. Um, other questions, I think, will feed into the panel then later. Thank you. Quite many questions. Thanks a lot for the interest. Um, so, um... I don't know where to start with the paper is the easiest because uh, you can always get uh, the paper. Every member st state has put in place a system for you to get uh, a paper version of the certificates. This paper will have again a QR code on it. So it's um, well, partly digital and that's why the system is called a digital COVID certificates despite the fact that you can get it on paper. Um, then for the acceptance uh, of vaccines, uh, I mean, the system itself, it's not blocking any vaccines. So it's very open to any vaccine and every country uh, can decide to uh, accept also those vaccines which are used, uh, which are, for example, WHO approved, uh, but not uh, used in the EU, not having the EU-wide authorization. Uh, there are four vaccines at the moment with uh, EU-wide authorization and I think uh, was it eight or seven vaccines which are on WHO list and every member state must always accept uh, those vaccines on the, let's, let's call it the EMA list, um, but they may also extend it to WHO list and even further, uh, further vaccines. Uh, for example, some member states are having vaccines in, in use following national authorization that is also possible, but the system uh, is not no, specifically blocking any, any vaccines and um, also uh, in some cases when people uh, get um, as the first dose one vaccine, as the second dose second vaccine, another vaccine, uh, the system is supporting such uh, cases. Mm -hmm. And after every dose you can get a certificate, uh, it will be a different one. Um, so the QR code does not update itself, uh, but um, yeah, you will get a certificate after every um, every dose. I don't know if I missed some uh, questions. I fear that even if you did, uh, we're going to have to hold it there for now because I want to leave time for the discussion afterwards. I, I, I can see that there's a lot of practical questions around this. but So I think that the summary is the, the system itself 
is not attempting to make decisions about what are or are not appropriate vaccines. What are or are, it's simply being a secure means of demonstrating what vaccines people have had. Is that is that fair? Yeah, basically, uh, there are some rules uh, for vaccines in the regulation saying that uh, every member state must accept those uh, vac vaccines with EU-wide authorization, but mm -hmm. they may also, of course, accept uh, some other vaccines. And the system supports all of them. Thank you very much indeed. So what I'm going to do now, colleagues, we promised you a break. Um, we're a little bit behind time. So what I'm going to suggest is that, um, uh, which is only due to the, the huge interest that, uh, that we've had in all of our, of all of our speakers. What I'm going to suggest is we're going to have a break. We're going to, instead of 10 minutes, it's going to be five minutes. Hopefully that's still enough time for you to have, uh, to stretch your legs, to uh, grab a coffee if you like. Um, and then we will return for our panel discussion. Excellent. Now, I hope you're refreshed. I hope you've thought of questions. Feel free to put additional questions into the chat now that you've had a pause for reflection. Although, honestly, I think we've had so many issues raised already that we're, we already are set for a very interesting panel discussion. So I would, this is where if we were sat on the beautiful island in Venice, I would invite you all to come, uh, all the panelists to come and join me on the stage. But can I invite you all to virtually come and join me on the stage? Um, and uh, yeah, and thank you very much again for your, um, for your wonderful presentations. Um, and um oh and now you've come with a dog miklosh as well which is uh, which is especially uh, which just adds to the uh <laughs> um so i'm gonna there are a couple of themes that i would like to pull out and then i will ask my colleagues to come in with uh, maybe additional points that they want to to raise we have so many questions really the two overall themes for me one is about in terms of all these new technologies and new sources of data and innovative ways of linking data that your different presentations have raised. One of the tensions which has come across very clearly from your presentations from the chats is how do we balance this with privacy and with consent and with trust and that sort of tension between new data sources and large scale research on the one hand and data and trust on the other. And the other one I think is about how we go about doing this and what is required to do this. And that's partly about things like um, the who needs to, the regulatory environment and sharing data. And Miklos, for example, this, you know, why, for example, some companies were willing to share data with you and others. Um, perhaps also the speed, Marion, with which you were able to work in the in, in the recovery trial, which maybe is normal and, and what could change in terms of that. So these two issues about how um, privacy, the tensions between individual data and rider privacy and trust, and also these questions of strategic independence. Um, and I'm just going to invite you to sort of comment on these general issues and perhaps some of the specific points that you want to raise as well as and we'll go initially in the same order as the presentation so Miklos I'll come to you first because one of the things that you said on the way through for example is that Google wouldn't share the data with you um, and one of the people in our comments was outraged by that so how do you how, how have you you said right at the start this question about striking the balance in terms of security um, how do you see these issues of privacy and consent, and also maintaining independence and authority for the at national level. Yeah, the, the number one comment from me is that uh, when we did the joint national eHealth system regulation back in 2013, uh, we said that data saves lives. Uh, you know, donate organs, that saves lives. Donate data, that saves lives. So we said, fine, if we have negative consent in the, in the organ transplant, regulations why can't we have negative consent in the in the in the data uh, in the health data issues so the so what came out is that the hungarian joint uh, national e health system is negative consent you can and up until you say no your data could be used by the treating physician with the exception of mental disorders and uh, sexual orientation and sexually transmitted diseases that is locked 
but your GP can see uh, your health data and your treating physician can see your health data. Uh, the Dutch solution was, I think, from the bottom up. So it was it was a different um, it was a different uh, uh, logic. But there is the, the the number one panel that was installed in the joint national health system was the was the consent uh, uh, module. But uh, this is one thing. The other stuff is the strategic independence and sovereignty and data sovereignty. Uh, so one of the concerns of the companies, and also when we negotiated with Google, it was Google's uh, uh, concern is that uh, once we share the data with you, then people will be suspicious uh, about how much we know about them. <laughs> and that's why they were afraid uh, to share data. That was number one. Uh, and, why they're afraid, Google. We, uh, we assume that Google knows everything about us already. I... Uh, you know they know everything, uh, so I, I, I yeah, and, and 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 you know they and but the but the mobile companies what the mobile companies said is that uh, at, at the beginning they uh, when we when we did the reports and that we had the uh, presentations public presentations on the methodology they asked not to mention uh, the the name of the company uh, because they were afraid that uh, that people might believe that the data is used uh, for tracing them. And they, uh, but it, it took us about six months to tame them. Uh, and and once they once they got to know us and once they got relaxed, they even uh, they even joined with the scientific publication. Uh, and then the then then Vodafone even used uh, used the methodology for uh, for malaria monitoring in Africa. Uh, so so it was uh, and then they and they used the methodology internationally. So it it it, it was an it was an evangelism. Uh, but uh, but they were uh, but I have to tell you that all what they did they did it from social responsibility. Uh, it was personally by the managers of these companies and uh, and their data scientists. So it was a very nice uh, uh, collaboration, and they understood that uh, given that they fall under Hungarian uh, jurisdiction, uh, and and the Ministry of um, Innovation and Technology and Innovation was with us, and we were the official team of the of the of the operative body. Uh, so it was a, it was an authentic relationship between them that that, that helped a lot. And um, and uh, the and you know one of the one of the uh, most important features of our methodology that it is a sovereign methodology. Every country could do it. Uh, we know the legal issues around it and it's clear. Uh, so you can switch it on, you can install the, the download, you can switch it on anytime. And you do not have to beg uh, those uh, data giants uh, to share their data uh, with you. They have, they have much higher definition data. And even from that much higher definition data, they see the same. So the so it's it's the exact same thing that they see from the data. Interesting. Thank you very much indeed. So there's actually much more that is possible technologically than we normally manage to convince these organisations to do in practice and politically. And it's interesting that they're just in some ways they're just as nervous about it as other people are in terms of public perception. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah, Marion. So. There was one of, we, we were talking about this sort of between us in the background uh, and, and what the word that somebody used about the NHS was data utopia in one of our, uh, one of the comments. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know. Did this feel like a data utopia to you as you were doing the, uh, the recovery trial? Yes and no, I think. Um, I think one of the real strengths is that they, that there is this existing collation of central data sets that's used for planning within the NHS, but has had um, dissemination for research built in from the start. So there are standard methods of making an application. There's an independent group that look at your application. There's a kind of set pathway for linking with these data sets, which is um, in some ways a, a data utopia. And, you know, I think it's absolutely fantastic that these data sets can be used um, and I think it benefits patients. Um, on the other hand, there are some challenges. Um, as, uh, as we described, you have to be sure that you've linked with the correct person. You've then got to process the data sets. They're not designed for research. 
So you've got to have kind of algorithms and methods of identifying what you're looking for for your particular research. And you've got to be able to demonstrate that that's a robust thing, understand where you might be missing data or where you may have uh, mis a quote, you know, inaccurately classified somebody as having a particular condition because of some coding practice or something like that. So I think it's a huge potential, but I think we also need the right tools to be able to use it. And one of the things that we've been working is work doing is working with the Health Data Research UK, um, uh, which is aiming to kind of facilitate the use of healthcare data across the, re the UK to, to sort of encourage dissemination of these kind of methods and sort of build resource within the research community really to do this. So it's a, it, it, it could be a data utopia. But isn't quite yet, perhaps. Um, and just two very specific questions before I move on to Fred. Um, so one of them, uh, somebody asked about uh, scientific publications, and I'm assuming that what we can safely do is direct them to the website of uh, Recovery and to Oxford, and they will see lots of scientific publications. Is that is that true? That's absolutely true. Yes, sorry, I didn't answer that before. If, you, if they go to recoverytrial.net, um, on the website, there's a results section with all the results publications, and there's also our standard operating procedures for how we've defined the, which data sets we've used, um, and how we've defined the outcomes, you know, with code lists or whatever else they might want to look at uh, there. So there's a bit of methods in there, um, as well as all the scientific publications. Fascinating, thank you. And then the other thing, so I think one of the things that struck people and that you talked about a lot in, in your presentation was about, um, you answered in terms of you know, the speed and the, and, and the sort of the, the elements of the way the trial was designed that made it able to work very quickly. But you also alluded to some elements of the wider regulatory and approvals context that also worked particularly quickly. Um, and uh, one person was interested in the, uh, sort of how would this compare, because this isn't the first trial you've been involved in, um, how does this compare? Like how much quicker or cheaper or more expensive was, has recovery been in comparison to any other similar trials that you've been involved in? Okay, so I mean, I think we can set it in some context. So the unit, the clinical trial service unit that I work in has spent decades specializing in trying to do trials more efficiently using novel methods. So this isn't new and actually recovery led heavily on the International Studies of Implant Survival, a group of trials that were designed by our unit, so Rory Collins and Sir Richard Peter, um, to, to, to look at, to try and address the question, well, what prevents death and acute heart attack? Um, so, so these simple methods have, have, have really been kind of lifted from that kind of um, uh, pioneering technology in the 1980s. Um, and, and so the, the other studies that, that I've been involved with working there have always sought to implement this simple design wherever possible. Mm. Um, although they are usually slower, so it normally gets takes you know 12 months to set up the study, get all the contracts in place and all the IT ready rather than a few weeks. But 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 you know the principles were there already. I think the problem comes when you perhaps look to how some trials elsewhere are done. So we have some cardiovascular trials, for example. I mean, okay, large trials, 20 to 25,000 people, and longer trials perhaps. You know, five-year trials, but they're costing you know over a billion dollars to run because of the complexity of the data collection systems, the verifying every data point, the monitoring everything. Um, you know, and, and and I think you know we come from a point where if we want to do lots of randomized trials, we really have to simplify that. So I suppose it sort of compares. It's quite similar to the trials I've worked on before, but probably not similar to most uh, randomized trials of medicinal products. Interesting. So many lessons that we uh, that we come out of, that come out of this period of time, and they're not just about well, let's just do you know we can work much quicker during COVID. It's also about well, actually we we can do things differently, and we could do that differently also outside the period of time of COVID. Thank you so much, Marion. I want to come to Fred, but, but Miklos, I can see that you, you're bursting to come in. Sorry, just, just a quick comment to Marion. Uh, you know, we, under emergency regulations, we have access to all the 
uh, all the case data in the Hungarian National Health Service, the health insurance fund data, the public health data, which is basically the COVID pandemic data plus everything. So at one point in time, in the, in the close future, we should, we should share some of the experiences because there might be some very interesting stuff. We, and and we, are, we are already data mining it on population level, whether metformin is protective and this kind of stuff we already do. Well, that's great. I, I, would, I would love to do that. You just need to add a randomization. You've got to try. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> we should, at one point, we should come back to that. Yeah. yeah. Now, now this, this is beautiful because if we were on the island in the Veneto, I'm sorry, I know I keep talking about the island, but for those of you who don't know, it is beautiful. This is exactly the kind of discussion that we would be having because that's the other thing that the observatory does in general and the summer school in particular, which is we want to try and make these kinds of links. So thank you both for being open to that. That's really, we really appreciate it. Um, Fred, the, the, Dutch, the Dutch system is clearly one which has evolved in a slightly different, is striking a different balance in terms of this trust and confidentiality and different actors. Having listened to some of the other presentations, what's, what's your perspective? What, what's your reaction on this um, from the perspective of the Dutch? Yeah, well, I think um, you raised two very important issues, the balance between privacy and trust and the strategic uh, independence. Um, and um, well, the balance between privacy and trust, we try to, to address that by giving more tools to people to, uh, to control their data and just do all we can to keep it safe. But maybe even, um, I wouldn't say more important, but also important is the balance between accessibility and privacy. So what we notice with, uh, and probably other countries will have that as well, that it is sometimes very um, uh, difficult to ensure that the access to a system is being done in a safe way uh, without making it complicated. So if you make it complicated for a lot of people, it becomes too difficult to access their public, their personal health environment, for example, and maybe other systems. So the balance between access, accessibility and, and privacy is, is also a very important one in our perspective that we are struggling with on a daily basis. And then the issue of uh, strategic independence. Um, well, I told that uh, all parties, including Google, Apple, they have to follow our rules before uh, getting access to the data, at least by our healthcare providers. Of course, there are many other data that they have already access to, but. Uh, if they want to use the data of our healthcare providers, they must enroll in the system. They haven't done that so far. They started to do it in the beginning, but now they, they stopped. Um, of course, if new technology allows Google and Apple to bypass that, uh, and that is not <laughs> excluded, we will have to look at that, uh, that again. But in general, we try to ensure for the, for the public that, uh, that their data will only be uh, used by third parties uh, when they allow it. And we will make it easier for them to, to, uh, to decide whether they would like to do that. Uh, of course, we are not there yet. <laughs> um, and it is work in progress and not valid for all data, but uh, at least it is a kind of general principle that we like to follow. Thank you, Fred. And it's, yeah, to clear it, I, yeah, so every country is clearly taking its own approach to this. And we've heard about three very distinctive approaches today, but I, I guess, you know, every, all of us have to work within the national, social, cultural, and legal framework that we all have. But I think what this illustrates to us is the possibilities and the potential and the variety of different ways. But then of course, Constantine, the EU creates its own framework in a sense for all of this. So uh, do you have a perspective on these issues about, about trust and about uh, independence as well? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to strike a balance at some point and every time we see a new system uh, the first reaction of a general public it's it's, it's frightening uh, we don't build this system uh, it has too many security flaws by default uh, without even going into details it's by default bad you know probably Miklos has also heard something about uh, about that uh, when starting uh, this exercise in, in Hungary and uh, at some point um, well maybe the first approaches in some cases are are um, having uh, security problems or trust problems. Uh, we saw this with uh, contract tracing apps, for example. The first uh, apps were really centralized and uh, people were afraid that the government would be uh, following uh, where they go and so on. 
And then uh, the later versions were much better uh, because they were decentralized and uh, people uh, kind of uh, believe that it's possible without, uh, you know, building a big brother scheme behind. Uh, it was in a way similar in the EU digital COVID certificate because the first implementations of vaccination certificates, which we saw, um, you scan the QR code, you go to a website. That was the overall, um, you know, design of these first systems and uh, well, there are security uh, problems in this approach because, uh, first of all, in theory, this website could uh, track you because it sees where the certificate is scanned. I mean, it's uh, quite far-fetched, but still technically possible. Uh, the second problem uh, is that <clears throat> you can lure verifiers into going to some, some uh, weird uh, website. So, you now there was a change packing all the information in the offline verifiable QR codes. And after that, uh, we demonstrated that, yes, indeed, uh, with this approach, um, uh, security risks are um, well, diminished and we can build uh, the system. So um, it takes some time. But also uh, the point on strategic independence, it's important because um, in winter, when we were exploring possible options, what could be done and uh, how it could be done, um, um, there were many, many uh, different um, uh, initiatives and uh, also some international organizations were launching expert groups uh, and we were following all this exercise, but um, eventually we thought that, um, well, we have to make the system in two months, more or less. So if we keep waiting uh, for miracles to come, then perhaps it wouldn't be uh, possible to deliver in such a short time frame. So, Basically, of course, we can see all the possible uh, lessons uh, from these, uh, from these um, initiatives and so on. And still, uh, we decided that there is no other way than to build first the system for the European Union and maybe later expand to other countries. It was a smart choice. And um, yeah, we're extremely happy to see uh, also third countries now joining the system. Thank you. That's a very interesting perspective on, on both of those issues. Um, so Miklos, I'm gonna, I'm, what I'm going to do in a moment is come to Florian and, um, and he will raise some additional, we're going to pull in some additional questions from the, uh, from the chat. Did you want to comment already on the, on, on briefly, if you would, on the, uh, on the points which have been made? I can wait. I can wait. <laughs> <laughs> You're always very kind. Florian, additional, I mean, there have been so many questions and we're not going to have time for all of them, but are there some in particular that you would like to highlight? Yeah. Thanks very much, Nick, and, and thanks to all participants and, and panelists, of course. Um, I think one question that I promised earlier we'll pick up again, and I do want to keep that promise, um, that actually um, sums up quite nicely that the question about data, data privacy and trust has come in earlier from Kathleen. And she's been asking very, very straightforward terms um, to Fred, but I think it applies to, to, all, to all of the panelists here. Um, if the general population or the population overall, if all subgroups in the population understood the reasoning of why data collection is needed, and they always have a, a voluntary choice to opt in or opt out, um, more of those people would be willing to also share their data. Um, in the context of the Netherlands, it would be, for example, that if people knew that the data collection is relevant to make linkages between their individual health concerns and, and social determinants of health, many more people would also choose to, to um, feed into their public uh, or personal health and environment app. Um, we heard this the other day as well, one of the sessions when, when, when one of the panelists had said, people are very eager to sharing the data, but they do want to know for what. So if I may um, put this out as a question, and I'll, I'd like to, to move it over to, to colleagues. And I see that another question had come in from Jenny and from Melita, but very much aiming into the same direction as well. So it's, an, it's a burning one uh, among the participants. And Timmy, did you also have any questions you wanted to highlight or, or the, the in particular? As you said, there are uh, many, and I think Florian picked up the most obvious red thread among them. I have a, a personal question to ask, if that's if that's okay from myself, which is if we're, <laughs> because we, we as, as Reinhard Busser mentioned in one of the previous sessions, we, we have been doing and are doing with the observatory in the TU Berlin um, 
a study looking at how health data is linked in different countries, which types. Um, and so we see, for example, that we have in some countries when it comes to electronic health record data, double opt-out opportunities. So physicians can opt out from uh, contributing to research, uh, secondary use of data, and then patients can also opt out. And so clearly this is really important that patients have the power of their own data uh, on the one side, but on the other side, if we're looking at the, at the research angle, how can we ever get representative samples uh, in, in such a situation if it's voluntary to opt out um, and opt in at different levels? Just a, a, a general, um, general question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. And I think, Marion, that's something as well, because you, you highlighted in your presentation around you know, the, um, how can I put it, the, not just the structure of the trial, but the investment that there is in research within the NHS and the importance of that more generally. So perhaps you could come to, uh, you might want to speak to that. But on Florian's question, um, Fred, I sort of feel like you should, you might want to go first and responding to that. Yeah, basically I can answer two questions into one. <laughs> both questions. Um, um, the, um, well, first of all, the general population will be more willing to share data if, the, if these data are beneficial for them as well. And so the, the first step in, in um, with this uh, personal health environment is that you will collect your data and uh, try to comp uh, uh, complement to them with, with your own measurements. Uh, and then later you can decide uh, whether or not you're going to give access uh, to these data for research. We have not included that yet. Uh, we are not that far. We don't have all the data yet, but that will be a question for the future. To what extent you would like to make available the data in your personal health environment for secondary uses, including research. Um, and that is why at the moment uh, there will be multiple ways where you can gather data. So the, uh, what Dimitra is, uh, is saying is, is true uh, that we are also, uh, at the physicians, uh, the, the academic hospitals, they are also looking at ways how to collect data from um, uh, on an anonymous basis uh, for um, for, for research. Um, so they are making a kind of separate from this public health, uh, from this uh, personal health environments, making separate arrangements and set, uh, separate projects that I also uh, included in my, uh, my presentation. So it is a step-by-step -step approach uh, and multiple ways of gathering data. Thank you. And then Miklos, if I come to you, because I know you wanted to come in anyway. Um, and also, I mean, I think that the, the, the images that you presented were so powerful in terms of this very novel data source. And you talked about the social responsibility sense of the companies, but there must have been some public reaction as well to, to the government use of this, of this kind of data. You know, the, uh, the, the pandemic data is, is very, uh, how to say, it's, it's politically very sensitive. Uh, so in Hungary, the government, and in many governments, they need, Almost all the governments made mistakes, and uh, and then they had to give detailed explanations. And then as the things went more complex, uh, it was even more difficult to understand. And there was a point in Hungary when uh, when uh, when people wanted to know what is the justification behind all these all, <clears throat> all these interventions. And then we had a then we had a video conference that two million people watched. Two million. Uh, if you put the YouTube and the and the and the and the presentation together, and I say, wow! So you so you did did it on the basis of evidence, then it's fine. And why didn't you tell us before? Uh, so that was the reaction, and you know, and, and and it was the same when we did the joint national e-health system. You know who was the who were the uh, the uh, the biggest supporters? It was the patient associations themselves, uh, the rare diseases patients. Uh, yeah, I, I want. I know that, that that I can be healed with the data. So share the data, use the data. So it was the patient associations are very much pro data utilization. Of course, uh, with depersonalization and, and and data security, that's that's the basics. But they are very much pro uh, data utilization. And and the, and the one that I wanted to uh, uh, coming before is uh, is the vaccination passport and I and I fully agree with Constantine that's uh, uh, it is the it is the best possible solution that that the EU could do at this moment 
uh, and I'm sure that you know the Estonian uh, blockchain uh, version that, that was sort of not simply vaccination certificate, but a supply chain management uh, uh, sort of uh, solution. But imagine if we would have been able to do this supply chain uh, vaccination support, then we could do much more for the European citizen. Because if there are countries that were not able to use the stocks, then we could just borrow it and give it them back later and, uh, and, and vaccinate uh, people where there is urgency. So I think there could be, there could have been uh, a much more intelligent solution. So, so you know, we, with the vaccine procurement, we learned a lot with the H1N1, and now there was this joint procurement. And I think we should learn uh, from this COVID uh, vaccine procurement stuff, and and we should we should go for more intelligence and more integrated solutions in the future. Going for more intelligence always sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Um, so we, the last one, the AI. Uh, the you know the AI changes everything because if you want to develop uh, AI for the diagnostics modalities, you need samples, uh, and those are depersonalized samples. And I think GDPR uh, is uh, is twentieth century answer to this problem. So we should we should uh, there should come a time uh, in the very close future when, from the AI perspective, we reevaluate uh, the the GDPR just to be just enable the uh, the, uh, the data scientists and the medical community uh, to develop AI solutions from the samples. And, and because then, then it's the data, the diagnostic data of an individual is a medicine for another one. We are, um, uh, Miklos, you're giving me a beautiful uh, uh, jumping off point to trail the, the last sessions of the observatory, uh, because one of them is going to be a panel discussion, which is going to be forward looking about you know, how we build on the, this, this sort of this innovation and change in digital health during the COVID pandemic. I'm going to come on and mention that in a couple of minutes because we only have, but we only have a couple of minutes, and I want to have any last comments from Marin and from Constantine in relation to the questions which have been asked. So, Marin, might I might I come to you? Yep, yeah, just briefly. I mean, I think um, uh, I think we have to give individuals the opportunity to opt out, and the onus is on us to engage with the public. We must, as researchers and governments, put across the cost of not doing this sort of research. People see the risk, but they don't see the risk of not doing it. Um, and somehow, I mean, I, I just think a, 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 a webinar attended by two million people is just fantastic. That That's where we need to go, um, because unless we um, get these concepts over to patients, and we also need to get the additional concepts of de-identification and the safeguards that are put over the data sharing. Who's saying this is for public benefit? What sort of identifiers are shared? Mm -hmm. um, for too long, researchers have behaved like Google. Maybe people don't know what they're doing, maybe they weren't right, but we need to actually engage with the public. So I think that's the key. Constantine. That's very yeah, thank nice. you very much. Maybe a short comment uh, about uh, health data sharing. Um, actually, I don't like the word health data sharing. I like uh, the words access to health data when uh, the person uh, is benefiting from that. And the person must be in control. We have to produce the sense of control. It could be opt-in, it could be opt-out. It's different legal basis in the GDPR, but um, the most important fact is that um, the person can decide and uh, they can um, either stop something which is um, by default available or opt in into, into that model. We have seen multiple implementations in different EU member states. Um, and that applies also to uh, COVID certificates, for example. So uh, people need to be uh, able to be in control to hold on to that paper and to know that if I'm not showing it to anyone, my data is safe. If I'm showing, then it's fine. I'm showing it myself. So this sense of control must be there and solutions are many, many. Thank you very much. These are, these are fantastic notes for us to end on. Um, you've given us, as I said, Miklos, but all of the panelists, you've given us great food for thought um, in your presentations today. Uh, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of, of the observatory in the Veneto region for your contribution to the summer school. You've given us beautiful jumping off points for the panel debate that will take place in our final session, which will, 
uh, be tomorrow starting again at, um, at three o'clock in the afternoon on a strategy for digital health. But we have a double uh, opportunity for you tomorrow because we can't bring you all to the Veneto, but we can bring the Veneto to you because we're going to have an additional session in the morning uh, on how the COVID-19 experience has fostered digital health services in the Veneto region. Italy was sadly, as, as you will all know, one of the countries that was hardest and earliest hit by the COVID pandemic within the European region. And that forced a lot of adaptation and learning and some very innovative solutions which are going to be discussed uh, tomorrow. And uh, I really think this, it's gonna be a fascinating session. That will be between 10 till 12 in the morning, Central European time. That requires a separate registration. You can just click on the link on the website for the Observatory Summer School, and that will get you the link for that session tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. And then, as I said, the concluding session of the Summer School itself starting at three in the afternoon. My enormous thanks to um, our esteemed speakers this afternoon, uh, to Miklos, to Marion, to Fred, and to Constantine, uh, to my colleagues, uh, Florian and Dimitra, as well as Annalisa and Simone. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed the session this afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much.